welcome everybody. We're just gonna wait a minute or two just to let everyone uh, get into the webinar. Welcome everybody, just another minute as we wait for a few more attendees to come in. All right, I think we're gonna get started. Uh, welcome, my name is Alexander Bertel. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Caribbean Journal, the world's largest website covering Caribbean travel. Uh, and welcome to the 2020 Caribbean Travel Outlook. Uh, it's very exciting that we can be here today even having an outlook. Uh, a few months ago, when the entire Caribbean was locked down, uh, it was difficult to imagine uh, when we would ever return to the, to the travel industry, when travelers would return. Uh, now, we're starting to see some positivity. Uh, we're starting to see destinations open up, and a lot of that is because of the lockdown. The Caribbean was a success story, I think, in a lot of ways uh, for the world in its aggressive, strong measures against COVID. Um, and those measures have now led to this possibility to be able to open up. Uh, this week, we're starting to see the first Caribbean destinations reopen their borders for tourism. The U.S. Virgin Islands on Monday reopened. Uh, St. Lucia and Antigua are reopening this week. Uh, other destinations like Aruba and Jamaica are opening towards the second half of the month at, uh, at the earliest. Um, so we're very excited uh, to see that happen. The question now is, what will travel look like? Uh, when will travelers really start coming back in numbers? How do we get them to come back? How do we get them to feel safe? Um, how do we change our operational practices to ensure that they're safe and the people who work on the island and in these destinations and in these hotels are safe? Um, so that balancing act is very important. Um, to answer some of these questions, we've gathered a very esteemed panel uh, with you here today. We have Frank Tomito, uh, CEO of the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association. Diana Plasas, Chief Sales and Marketing uh, Officer for Caribbean Latin America at Marriott International. Mariela Sanchez, General Manager for Specialty Sales Development at Delta Airlines. Leah Chandler, CDME, the Chief Marketing Officer for Discover Puerto Rico. And Renella Chanishu Crows, CEO of the Aruba Tourism Authority. Now, before we get started, I just want to say uh, we want to keep this interactive as possible. So please, if you have any questions, uh, leave them in the Q&A box below and we'll try and get through to them uh, as best we can. Uh, so I'm going to let Frank start things off. Thanks for being here, Frank. Can you hear Frank? Frank, you're in mute. Uh, Frank, you got to unmute. Thank you, Thanks. Thank you, Caribbean Journal, for putting this together today. I have, I can control my screen now? Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm, I'm going to jump right into this. Uh, I mean, um, prior to COVID-19, the, the industry globally and regionally was, was on an unprecedented growth trend. Um, 
for, for nearly 10 years, outpacing every other sector in, 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 in the industry globally in employment, contribution to GDP and other areas. And, uh, and as you can see here, the green line on the bottom there kind of represents tourism's growth globally. And the line below is the global growth of GDP. Uh, so we were just on an unprecedented run and the region was no uh, exception to that as, as Alex had, had, had mentioned earlier. But, and the bottom, the bottom fell out uh, several months ago. We're, basically we've lost uh, about 30% of, of our jobs in the industry globally, over 30% as well of, of a drop in GDP thus far. So the impact has been considerable. On occupancy, you see how the, uh, the Caribbean just dropped precipitously uh, uh, come early March, and uh, we're, we're actually below that 8.4% right now. We, we actually don't even know because not everybody's reporting, but uh, but we, we, we believe we're, we're, we're probably around under 3% on occupancy. And see. Aviation industries have seen dramatic uh, drop in, in, in the region. This is regional data, $5.3 billion in losses so far, uh, $740 million in, in uh, yeah, and its impact on, 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 on um, aviation and job loss as well in that sector. We're estimating that thus far, and the, the impact for the Caribbean on tourism has been about a $6 billion estimated loss in GDP, in, earn, in earnings from tourism between March and May. Uh, $2 billion estimated loss in tax revenue as that goes through a multiplier effect throughout the economy. And over 1 million uh, jobs are, uh, are estimated uh, temporarily lost at this point. So the impact has been severe. And, and we surveyed our mem members uh, in mid-April basically to get a read on uh, where things are at in a variety of areas. Here's a summary of some of that. 69% of the Caribbean hotels hope to reopen by the end of July. Uh, we, we expect it'll be intra-Caribbean business and leisure travel first expected and followed by stopover travel from the U.S in Canada, then from Europe as markets begin to open up and airlift begins to return. Um, gradual recovery was expected uh, with 28% of the hoteliers expressing confidence in a tourism turnaround beginning by the end of 2020, but most anticipating the turnaround to take longer. Uh, other data that we have shows that basically right between now and the end of the year, we'll be looking at occupancies between 10 and 40%. And uh, next, uh, peak season likely running under just under 50 percent in occupancy and then again that's not assuming that's assuming no no further uh, pandemic uh, outbreaks in a, in a major way uh, the uh, good news as well is that uh, the, the Caribbean uh, in terms of cancellations 43 percent of those who canceled uh, have, have rebooked so we are we're expecting we will recapture some of that business in the process Lots of emphasis on health and safety, even before this, because of our experiences with things like Zika and so on. Uh, we had uh, just 2% uh, of, of, of hotels reported a case of COVID uh, over the last two months, uh, sourced out of the hotel. Uh, what, what changes do you plan to put in place? Uh, lots of health safety protocols already we're removing in that area, but you can see in the emphasis there uh, where, where a, a lot of efforts are going into investments going into health safety training and protocols and operational technology changes and so on. Our area of focus as an organization has been on information sharing. Our first webinar on this was on February 4th on research. We've done a variety of uh, our own research as well as uh, uh, coordinating other information. We believe strongly that getting out of this requires a lot of collaboration at the regional as well as local levels. We're seeing it at an unprecedented level with governments and the industry. Uh, health safety protocols have to be the focus. Lots of that's being put in place and has to be backed with training and so on. And that's what we're doing in those areas. So there's been a, a lot of effort, uh, it, despite the capacity challenges by uh, our, our organizations as well, because we've all been affected because of the revenue. In terms of outlook, MMGY does the Portrait of the American Traveler uh, research and basically pointed out to us, uh, they've been following trends where, the, where people want to travel. The desire before COVID uh, was, was uh, the Caribbean was one of the highest areas of wanting to travel to. You can see some of the destinations listed there. So we've got a high recognition value, high kinds of uh, 
uh, likelihood or desire to travel kinds of data out there that continues to be reinforced. Those dips that you're seeing there are from the 2017 hurricanes. But on the trend line, we're doing incredibly well in terms of consumer recognition and desire to travel to the region. So that positions as well. Uh, MMGY just did some recent research as well last month, uh, basically getting an indication of uh, timing of travel bookings after the pandemic by, uh, by, by generation. And you can see that there's a desire, particularly in the younger generation, to get out there, get out and about much more quickly than, than the older generations, which makes sense. And then the same thing with income, but it also tells us that down the line, there's a desire by those in the high income categories to, uh, to, 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 to get out and about and to travel. So the, the pent up demand is there. How do we rebound? We rebound fairly quickly. Uh, the crisis, this is from WTTC. Uh, it used to take us a lot longer to rebound. And this one's not gonna, we're not gonna climb out of this quickly, but we do have the ability from experience, particularly in our region, from hurricanes and so on to rebound quickly. And we cut that, that recovery time. As you can see right here, you can see how just over time with arrivals, how, how we've rebound. On here, you see what happened with Puerto Rico and St. Martin, how quickly they got up to in, in, in 15 and 20 months up to uh, respectively 70% uh, of, uh, of, of getting to pre-hurricane uh, 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 status in terms of their arrivals. So uh, where we don't fare as well as in terms of occupancy, even though the arrivals come back faster, it takes a little bit longer on the occupancy side, but certainly takes even longer on the ADR side. So it's important that in our industry, we're careful about offering value packaging and, and not messing too much with that, that, that base rate. It takes longer to get back. Finally, in terms of our six points, six pillars of recovery focus as an industry, as a, a Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, we, we're advancing business-friendly policies in a variety of circles, and we're seeing some of that, and we're asking for more as well. And uh, uh, looking at ways to improve the traveler experience around health, safety, and clean and safe. Uh, public relations and marketing is absolutely critical, getting the facts out, easing consumer worries, uh, planning for the long term while working on the immediate needs and challenges that we have and doing it in a collaborative way. And finally, the most important part, and we're revving it up quite a bit, and we're seeing that uh, across, across the industry with destinations as well as companies, Training, 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 training. Health safety protocols have to be put in place, have to be uh, trained and, and, and adhered to. We have to build confidence, not only with consumers, but with our own people, our employees as well. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. And I think that's a perfect segue uh, in talking with Diana. Uh, Marriott was really the first hotel company to put out sweeping health and safety protocols. So Diana, we're gonna move things over to you. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you're seeing. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Alex, and thank you, Frank, for that great information. So when we were finishing uh, 2019 and even to January and February of this year, we were actually seeing a great growth, great pace coming in across our markets, across the Caribbean. And then we started hearing everything, obviously, at end of December, early January, coming from our teams in China and across Asia Pacific around the rise of COVID-19. And that really helped us start to get prepared by hearing what they were going through, everything that they were having to prepare with and what they were having to do at the hotel level as it continued to spread. And then obviously through our colleagues across Europe, Middle East and Africa. But we started 2020 filled with optimism. Again, Frank showed some of those trends that we saw the destinations continuing to grow in intent. And we were seeing our redemptions of our loyalty members and everything across the region. And, we're expecting some of those similar trends. Well, many of us have been obviously now home for about 10 weeks or so. We know that as Marriott International, we have a mission to continue to inspire travel. When you travel, we do it for different reasons, whether it's for business, for leisure, and the Caribbean destinations are those that are always at the top of the list. And during the times of crisis, we've been, provide, we've been really focused at Marriott on ensuring that we're providing some of that continued inspiration around travel and many of our destinations, but also that we're helping those that are on the front lines of responding. So we provided rooms for responders across the US and now also in Mexico from our region perspective. We've committed over $10 million of hotel stays for healthcare professionals in those markets in partnership with our financial partners. Now we've also created a community caregiver rate, which is actually available all across the Caribbean and Latin America 
to provide those discounted rates to those first responders. And we continue to be obviously very optimistic around travel and what we're doing, but first and foremost, with a commitment to clean. So as you mentioned, we were the first hotel brand to launch a new health and safety program. Health and safety have been at the heart of Marriott's approach to hospitality. And our company's 93 year commitment has never been more important than it is now. So we continue to innovate and test new methods. We have enhanced our cleaning standards and are carrying out a higher frequency of disinfecting protocols. And in addition, we've made several operating adjustments adding signage, barriers, spacing out furniture, et cetera. We're also maximizing our current technology, whether it's our mobile check-in or our mobile key, and rolling out our electrostatic sprayers in partnership with some of our vendors to make sure that we're facing those challenges of today's pandemic. We're adding front desk shields, for example, and you can see here some of the image, hand sanitizing stations, signage to help remind guests about social distancing, all of our associates have to wear face coverings as part of their uniform, and we're providing deep cleaning of each guest room between stays, disinfecting wipes, wipes in each room for guest use, removing non-essential items, and many more. We're also doing this in some of the other more common spaces. So whether it's in the restaurants or bars, where we're modifying some of the floor plans, eliminating self-serve buffets, providing more of grab-and-go items, ensuring our food service is prepared with associates, obviously leveraging gloves and in accordance with all of the health department guidance. Meeting spaces, we know that meetings and events are gonna look completely different in the future. And we're making sure that we're leveraging local guidance, but also that we're collaborating with our customers, whether it's a corporate customer or an incentive travel group, and that we're leveraging some of the, our learnings and what they're looking for for their groups as part of it. And then if you're going to the Caribbean, obviously you wanna understand what your experience is gonna be in the pool or at the beach. So again, really ensuring that we're leveraging local government ordinances, cleaning protocols, repositioning, the pool chairs, beach chairs, et cetera, and how we're making sure that we're cleaning after every guest use. But one of the key, key things behind this is the partnership that we have to have across all of the travel journey to make sure that our guests are come back, that travelers wanna come back to the Caribbean. So it has to be about that full traveler journey from the airport to ground transport, planes, hotels, attractions, everything. We wanna ensure that travelers are seeing that connectivity. So it's great to be on this panel with obviously Delta and the, our partners in so many of the destinations and making sure that we're all providing that confidence in the traveler through that entire journey. We're also collaborating quite a bit with governments and making sure that we're understanding what their policies are and the approach that they wanna take on. Working with the airlines across all of our different partners, making sure that we're restoring the airlift, which is obviously a key need for these islands. Working with the tourism offices and the destinations so we can talk to the different travel audiences. Creating different incentives for travelers to book now for upcoming visits. And again, inspiring trust and fact and confidence around that. And we're monitoring very, very closely what our teams in Asia and in Europe and the Middle East are doing because we're seeing some great best practices come from it. We're seeing some great success, small success, definitely nowhere near the numbers that we were in 2019. So I wanna make sure that I'm um, cautioning that but we are seeing some of that leisure travel in the U.S. as well, obviously closer to home. As many markets open their beaches, we're seeing those travelers walking back to the hotels. When it comes to trends, obviously monitoring those very closely as well. We have seen plenty of surveys, whether it's the Forbes survey that said, you know, 82% of the country wants to make sure that they're getting out there or that when they're ready to make a reservation, we want to make sure that we're capturing that and that we're continuing to inspire travelers. So we launched our We Will Travel Again campaign about a month and a half ago or so. And it's using different imagery and videos, many of those from our Caribbean destinations and hotels. We are partnering with some key influencers to, again, showcase some of those inspirational moments in life and truly spark the desire to visit the Caribbean. 
And we know also that the experience of travel is gonna be changing. And whether it's the rise of slow travel, meaningful travel, the increased focus on sustainability and ethical practices, we wanna make sure that Marin International and all of our 30 brands that we're listening to that, that we're adjusting where needed, and that we're providing the right platform for our guests to be able to enjoy that. So we know that we're gonna see a change consumer and that the industry will evolve as a result. And again, as Marriott, we wanna make sure that we're continuing to lead as that part of that. And as part of our commitment, obviously, to the Caribbean, one of the key areas of focus is the pipeline, making sure that our guests know that we're committed to doing good and growing our business in the market. And whether it's reopening our hotels or whether it's adding more new hotels to the pipeline that we're doing so. One of the last few things that I wanted to share with you is around innovation. So again, Marriott has been recognized as one of the top companies for innovation globally. And whether it was with our use of mobile check-in and different technologies on property or the ways that you can ex experience your entire stay, we're also looking at additional ways of innovation, whether it's blended meetings with virtual and in-person attendees or any other formats of technology, because again, we know that many of those experiences are going to be different and it's how we continue to learn from them and how we continue to adapt. And I didn't want to leave a, a panel around the Caribbean without mentioning all inclusive. And this is one area where we're also really leveraging some of those innovation practices because I think the way that people know of all inclusive is the idea of buffets and obviously some of the big hotels. And we want to make sure that we're listening to our customers, but also leveraging all of the work being done around our evolution of travel across our brands into all-inclusive. We're incredibly committed to the growth of AI in the Caribbean. As we launched, obviously, Marriott's all-inclusive platform in August of last year. And we're continuing to expand. We have Punta Cana, Curaçao, um, Deal Sign, as well as Jamaica. And we closed the acquisition of the Elegant Hotels portfolio in Barbados back in December. So definitely making sure that we have that AI option available and that as we reopen those hotels or open those brand new properties, that we're providing the right sense of comfort and cleanliness and trust that that customer expects from Marriott, but then also obviously from an all-inclusive perspective. So again, all in all, it's it's about the full customer journey. It's about ensuring that we have the right engagement on digital, the right engagement across social, the right engagement on property with our ladies and gentlemen, our associates, and working with our partners to bring travel back to the Caribbean. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Diana. And I know that all-inclusive uh, entry by Marriott is something everyone is very eagerly anticipating. Um, awesome. So thank you again for that. And let's now talk to Mariela Sanchez from Delta. Mariela, what, what are you seeing, uh, what's happening in the, in the air sector right now? Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, Alex, uh, for, for that. Um, I'm general manager of sales development at Delta Airlines. I've been with the company for almost nine years in a variety of different roles in the commercial, uh, the commercial side of the business. Today, I'm going to talk to you about our Caribbean markets, as well as what Delta is doing to ensure that travelers feel like it's safe to fly again, and that, uh, more importantly, that we're absolutely ready for whenever that happens. Um, so in terms of our markets in the Caribbean, uh, in the month of June, we'll be up to 16 markets. And while that is not quite to where we were, uh, the 25 markets we were serving at over 430 frequencies, um, we are very excited to, to launch some new services in the month of June. It'll primarily be towards the second half of June and will be markets like Aruba, several markets in Jamaica, St. Croix, St. Thomas, among others, um, as well as continue to service to San Juan, Rep uh, Dominican Republic, excuse me, um, and St. Croix. Um, everybody at Delta is really looking forward to serving all of our customers throughout the Caribbean. Um, but our schedule is really, it's, it's highly subject to change. It's really subject to what's happening in the, in the government regulations as well as with our uh, health uh, officials as well. So I also wanna talk about a little bit more about um, how we're making sure that customers feel like it's safe to fly again. Our teams have been working around the clock to implement what we call our Delta Clean Initiative. In fact, hundreds of employees volunteered to clean some of our aircraft that had to be parked uh, temporarily 
um, and really did an excellent job to help us jump back the, the operation. Our research indicates that these Delta Clean efforts are having a positive effect and that um, they're paying off. Um, for all of those that are, that are seeing this webinar today, um, I'm going to talk about the Delta Clean efforts, but I highly encourage you to take a minute to go to Delta News Hub and you'll see our Chief Customer Experience Officer, Bill Lynch, walk us through in very uh, good level of detail all of the different measures that we've put in place. Delta is really trying to make sure that we are ready. We are ready for customers when they are ready to fly. So let me walk you through what we're doing. So Delta Clean is that every step of the travel journey, you can be rest assured that we've implemented enhanced cleaning measures and we've done it in partnership with the WHO and the CDC. As you think about the travel journey, when you get to the airport, the check-in area and the backdrop area, you will see that all of our employees will be required to wear masks and we will also ask that our customers uh, be required to wear a mask as well. All kiosks will be wiped down and sanitized frequently. We will provide hand sanitizer at various points throughout the travel journey. And we also highly encourage the use of our Delta Fly app, which will provide customers with a more, a, a touchless check-in as well as a touchless uh, boarding uh, process. All check-in counters have been wiped and sanitized. And in partnership with the Delta Flight Products, which is a subsidiary of Delta, uh, they came up with a really innovative design in partnership with our airport customer service to create plexiglass shields that are going to be and that are actually all are installed already in all of our domestic stations and those are to protect our customers as well as our employees. You will see baggage stations that will be wiped and sanitized throughout the day. When you think through, hang on, let me go to the next one here. As you get to the security checkpoint, we work super close with our partners in the TSA and the bins are being wiped down regularly and sanitized throughout the day. We will be implementing alternating lanes where available when customers are waiting in line to go through security. And we will be providing hand sanitizer as well as you walk out of the security checkpoint. Once you get to the gate, Once you get to the gate, we will be spraying all of our gates and our jet bridges with the electrostatic spray, similar to what my colleague Deanna had at, at Marriott. This electrostatic spray has a high grade disinfectant that's often used in healthcare settings. In addition to that, you will see again the, the plexiglass shields, and we encourage all of our flyers to wear to use the Delta Fly app. We'll also have installed decals on the ground on our jet bridges so that folks encourage people to practice social distance and we'll be also spraying all of the jet bridges. In terms of the boarding process, we've re-engineered that uh, post-COVID to have the boarding process start from the back of the plane to the front of the plane, calling up 10 rows at a time so that we really make sure that we're abiding by social distancing guidelines. Once you're on the board, on board of the plane. Oops. Okay, once you're on board, before you board the plane for your flight, we will be also spraying the cabin with the electrostatic spray with a high grade disinfectant. And the air in the cabin is either recirculated fresh air or air that is going through high-tech HEPA filters that extract about 99.9% .9 of all particles, including viruses. The over-the-head bin handles will be wiped and sanitized as well. And we will continue to wipe down all of the surfaces that are high-touch areas, as well as our flight attendants are empowered with additional cleaning tools to wipe down and clean as necessary. Once you get to your seat, we will be providing free wellness kits, which will include gel hand sanitizer, a mask, and we will be wiping down all tray, tray tables, seat screens, and seat back pockets. In the seat back pockets, we've eliminated all non-essential items, such as our Sky Magazine. We will no longer have that. 
Um, and we've also changed our in-flight services. For example, we will be providing a snack bag instead of a individual snacks and, and beverages. In that snack bag, you will have a bottle of water or a prepackaged uh, snack. It depends on your flight. But hopefully you can appreciate that once you're on board, you are boarding a very clean plane. And we'll continue, the crews will continue to do extensive manual cleaning to wipe down all of the high touch service areas. Once you get to the baggage claim, all of the counters are gonna be wiped down and sanitized throughout the day. You will again see the plexiglass barrier and we will be spraying again the baggage claim area uh, throughout the day into all of our domestic locations by the end of this month. Delta is ready for whenever our travelers are ready to fly again. Thank you all for your business and we appreciate your support. Thank you so much, Mariella. Those are all really important uh, answers to questions we've all been having. Um, now we're gonna move to destinations. Uh, let's talk to Leah Chandler from Puerto Rico. Uh, how are we gonna get travelers to come back? How are we gonna generate demand and, and what do you see happening? Thanks, Alex. And, uh, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, Discover Puerto Rico has been since, uh, since early March working against the crisis plan that was built specifically to address the issues related to COVID-19. Today we remain in phase two of this plan, the regroup phase. Before entering phase three, we're obviously looking for some key benchmarks like travel restrictions to and within the island being lifted or reduced. And of course, we're all looking uh, for that critical mass of tourism related businesses to reopen um, in order to accommodate those visitors when they arrive. Getting our tone and our messaging right has really been instrumental in keeping the island in the hearts and minds of consumers over the past three months. And as we finally enter the phase now where we're going to be working to generate demand, I think that this messaging becomes even more critical for us. In the first stage of Discover Puerto Rico's messaging strategy, we really sought to keep Puerto Rico top of mind. I know that's what a, a lot of destinations have been doing, even though we couldn't actively encourage um, visitation. Here you see just an example, it's a creative storyboard of one of our spots centered around the concept, all in good time. And uh, it really says, you know, all in good time, we're going to welcome visitors back with, with open arms. This um, concept of time uh, that, that we developed um, specifically was meant to address the challenges of marketing during this crisis. Um, it was developed in partnership with, with our creative agency, r and Partners, but we were able to produce it 100% in-house, um, knowing that we didn't have the, the capabilities to go out and, and shoot a lot of new footage. Um, the second stage, which you see here of our messaging, is really developed to begin driving demand, which is uh, a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, it's really going to turn the focus from purely inspiration and dreaming to inspiration and confidence. We're going to move from all in good time to it's time. Uh, an example again of uh, what you see here. And, you know, as, as the world prepares to open, you know, this is the time to build confidence about traveling to Puerto Rico and giving people who have been daydreaming about their next vacation the permission to go. And I think it's important here, you know, we have to, we have to remember that we're not only convincing people today to travel to Puerto Rico, we're convincing them again to travel, period. We're convincing them to get on a plane. We're convincing them to stay at a hotel. So this messaging, again, becomes more critical um, than ever. This phase uh, that, that we're talking about here is it's about excitement. It's about empowerment. Um, for Puerto Rico, it's also going to be supported with proof points like ease of access and no passport, as well as delivering on this new standard of safety, uh, which I know we're all um, very hyper focused on right now and, and for good reason. But we can't just tell people that they're going to be safe in our ads. We have to actually show them. Discover Puerto Rico recently released a condensed consumer-friendly version of our visitor health and safety guidelines to provide a quick glance, easy to understand snapshot of the main mandates surrounding the new COVID-19 health protocols, a lot of which are seen here today and I'm sure you're, you're seeing from other destinations. 
we're currently developing um, as well a companion video that we'll be able to use in our social media channels um, as we prepare visitors for what their experience is going to be like on the island because we know the experience they might have had six months ago is is not going to be uh, is not going to be the same as the experience they're going to have when they visit the island now and so um, managing those expectations is going to be very very important the workhorse really for our comeback strategy uh, has been earned media. Um, communications efforts remain really, really critical along with our partners at Ketchum, our communications agency. We're continuing to find ways to rev that news engine proactively positioning our destination across a variety of media channels. So it's not just leisure anymore, um, it's trade, it's mice, and it's hard news, keeping Puerto Rico again um, top of mind with all of those critical audiences. From an earned media perspective, it's important we're continuing to promote the destination very responsibly while still highlighting the unique um, attributes that make Puerto Rico really special and, and of course inspire that future travel. Um, consumer media uh, and, and the mindset are shifting as states across the U.S. have continued to loosen their restrictions. And so it's getting even harder for us to break through that media clutter um, to generate positive awareness and coverage for the island. While we're continuing, of course, to support our local tourism community, which has been a focus for us um, throughout the recent crisis. Uh, looking at kind of a, a second pillar here in terms of driving demand is paid media. Here what you see is the timeline of our media reactivation with social having relaunched on April 9th. Social media has really played a crucial role for us in staying engaged with future visitors during the pandemic. It's going to continue, we feel like, um, to be really vital as we move into the demand generating phase, as it really allows us to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations with consumers. They're asking questions like, when are your beaches going to open? Or do I have to wear a face mask at the pool? And so these are opportunities for us to be very candid with consumers and again, help manage those expectations. From a paid media standpoint, we're still working towards uh, announcing what that, that date is going to be for an official phase two launch when our complete paid media is, is sort of full funnel and we're fully welcoming travelers back. But we're obviously very hopeful it's going to, to be in the next couple of weeks. And regarding our MICE marketing efforts, meeting clients where they are has really been the focus for our sales team internally. The It's Time campaign with MICE Focus Executions will be launched along with phase two of our general marketing campaign. And the main distribution for this messaging is going to be our MICE social channels along with key strategic partnership marketing opportunities. Similar to uh, the consumer campaign and, and the It's Time, the MICE executions will play to the island's accessibility and our rigorous new health and safety guidelines. And when clients can't make it to the island, we're developing virtual site visit videos to highlight our meeting venues and hotels so that these important planners have the tools to make decisions about bringing events and clients to Puerto Rico. We've also created a meetings version of the health and safety guidelines that I mentioned earlier so that we can easily convey to meeting planners how we're approaching these, these important needs and, and the changing needs. Um, the information uh, that we've shared here today, I, I know will be available after the, the presentation ends. Um, and it's obviously going to continue to evolve as we monitor consumer sentiment and other key data points, along with our island mandates, in order to really strategically time out our invitations uh, to those visitors and ensure that Puerto Rico is really strongly positioned to capture demand um, during the upcoming recovery. So thank you again for your time. I'm going to turn the screen over now to the CEO of the Aruba Tourism Authority. Awesome. Thank you, Leah. And now we'll go to Renella. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. So road to recovery. Um, thank you for all of the insights uh, shared so far. Uh, as the Aruba Tourism Authority, being the official custodian of Aruba's tourism industry, one of our key objectives is to ensure that we are properly prepared to um, respond to any emergency arising from a tourism perspective. As such, our financial model, which is embedded uh, amongst other in the applicable legislation, calls for a mandatory emergency fund. 
one is to which is to be used only for marketing purposes for us it is the first time that we will have to tap into this fund aruba being one of the most uh, tourism reliant nations in the world um, certainly having had to make the decision to close our borders um, has had and shall continue to have an unprecedented impact on the nation and our community as a whole. Nevertheless, I do not doubt that um, our nation will come back strongly and same is applicable for our region, uh, even though it might take some time. In respect to our response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic, we undertook or we undertake several key roles. So some of the highlights include that as the Aruba Tourism Authority, we form part of the National Crisis Team and the Committee of Recovery and Innovation of Aruba. Also in collaboration with key tourism partners, the ATA produced a tourism recovery marketing plan as part of the island's economic recovery track. The ATA leads the, the destination's international crisis communication approach as well as the overall international, international marketing for the destination. And the ATA developed uh, the Health and Happiness Code program in collaboration with the Department of Public Health and our tourism partners. As it pertains to our tourism recovery marketing plan, it is very important that the ATA from the onset develop a communications framework that is agile, not necessarily bound to a specific time frame, considering all of the uncertainties. Rather, it focuses on a number of phases characterized by specific elements as we trans transition out of the crisis. So the first phase being when consumers are at home, then when they're traveling back, and then thirdly, uh, we refer to it as the reunion could be the reunion with our community or the re reunion amongst themselves as friends or family members. In each of these phases, it is critical to take into account the frame of mind of the audience to ensure the connection is not lost with the potential or past visitor. At all times, the underlying brand anchor remains happiness and how the destination contributes towards this, basically. This plan also includes a series of scenarios uh, that could be possible outcomes for 2020 and beyond in terms of stayover arrivals and cruise tourism arrivals. Also airlift, uh, um, which is integrally linked to airlift aspects. And it also includes the impact on GDP and other key economic indicators for Aruba. So as it pertains to scenarios, yes, we do continue to build and adjust our scenarios. And this is integrally linked to the airlift we have available, uh, what is on the books. And as this continues to develop, we continue to adjust as well. It is also, however, integrally linked to what consumers are saying to us and what we're finding not only through secondary research, but also through primary research. As such, we recently conducted a consumer sentiment survey in the North American market, and we asked our past visitors several questions. Are you considering traveling in the next six months? 62% are considering traveling in the next six months, either internationally or within their own country. And by the way, a total of 10,500 people responded to this survey. Then the second, another question we asked, are you considering traveling to Aruba? 17% um, indicated to consider to travel to Aruba in the next three months, as soon as measures are lifted, basically. So we continue to track these things so as to be able to also account accordingly for um, potential development and in, in, in impact from an economic perspective. Of course, not only this research, but also other research re-emphasizes the fact that the health and health protocols and the focus of health is, is so, so vital. What we've done as the Aruba Tourism Authority in collaboration with partners is defined 
what we are requesting or what will be requested from a visitor pre-arrival, also what will be the case upon arrival. Our accommodations uh, protocols have been developed. However, our hotel partners, of course, continue to augment this also through their own policies. And we've developed the Aruba Health and Happiness Code, which then accounts for all of the protocols um, for different uh, business partners, including taxi drivers, restaurants, activity providers, and you name it, all those components composing that customer journey. Without a doubt, this uh, crisis is one that requires a lot of change, a lot of adjustment. And um, I think this quote uh, sums that up perfectly, but it's also a moment of opportunity. And we've certainly, through different avenues, also made sure that we um, grasp the grab the opportunity to not only focus on what is required, what I just explained, but also to continue to train our people to make sure that uh, we take the moment to uh, certainly uh, elevate our service levels, our understanding of the business, but also to fast track several key investment projects that will certainly benefit the tourism industry. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ronella. And, and right now, I also just wanted to say that those are some really great presentations. Um, I think we've, we painted a really comprehensive picture of uh, all the different sectors and how they're all being affected right now. Uh, I wanted to go to some of the questions we have from the audience. Um, let's start with this one from Anastasia. Uh, she wants to know about mice, which is, I think a very important industry for the Caribbean. Uh, Puerto Rico has really been very successful in mice. Uh, has anyone surveyed buyers and decision makers to understand when they would consider in-person meetings as an option again? And how do you think this meeting format would be impacted in the medium to long term? Um, how do you see that? Let's start with you, Leah. How do you see mice being being affected? Well, I, th I think the, the, the good news is we are seeing some positive movement in the generation of new leads. In mm -hmm. the past month, even, we've seen signs that new event room night requests are showing signs of recovery. So things are moving in the right direction for sure. A key part of our recovery will take place once restrictions are lifted and we can begin to activate our existing pipeline. Um, but uh, again, the, the good news is that we do have a solid base of group customers looking to re-engage the island. Um, important for Puerto Rico is that these planners already know what Puerto Rico has to offer in most cases. We just now need to educate them on the measures we're taking to ensure they can operate their meetings safely. So I don't think there's a, uh, a hard fast date I could give you, but I would say the, the signs are pointing in the right direction for our island for sure. Even what we've seen about and what we know about COVID, um, do you see more meetings moving outside or holding more more of their events outside? Or do you think the Caribbean in that sense is actually better positioned uh, to do that? Leah? Is that for, is that for me? Yeah. I can chime in as well. Um, <laughs> if you want, Leah, we actually just did some customer panels uh, forums last week where we were asking some of our meeting planners and the different event companies a um, little bit more about what they were looking for. And definitely the idea of uh, unconventional meeting spaces came up when taking meetings outside. So what it looks like to set up by the pool or what it looks like to set up on the beach, definitely some interest around that. And, and to Leah's point of it on the mice, I think a lot of it is gonna be tied to also when companies, like if it is related to an association or different kind of sports groups or anything like that, as soon as they start lifting some of their restrictions, and as soon as they start increasing the number of people that can come to an for an event we're going to see it because again we are also seeing the volume of leads continue to increase for 2021 and 22 as people start thinking about that um, further out right um one, one other question we're getting is about all-inclusive uh i know diana you were talking about that uh with mari kilda wanted to know if puerto rico is considering adopting more all-inclusive my question about all-inclusive is how do you see the guest experience changing on island um, as we see movement more limited where we are everywhere around the world and guests are gonna be moving differently. How do you see that changing and how do you see that changing the way we market uh, experiences and moving around the island? Let's start with, with Leah. 
Well, I think as as it relates to all inclusives, uh, I mean, I, I think it's um, mostly known that Puerto Rico is, you know, not uh, we're we're not known for all inclusives. It's not product that that we have a lot of. Um, I think marketing is going to change in a lot of ways and how we're reaching out to customers. For destinations, the biggest change is that beautiful photos and sexy copy just isn't going to get it anymore. It's not going to be enough to sell travelers on your city or your state or your island. Um, as I mentioned earlier in, in my presentation, it has to really be a combination of this inspiration, but also the message about confidence and safety and educating consumers about what the destination as a whole, but also that uh, what your private partners are doing to, um, to really focus on the health and safety measures that are gonna make visitors feel safe and secure and comfortable. I think um, the, big, the big switch here is that it's, it's no longer going to be sell, sell, sell in the terms of us talking about our destination all of the time, we're going to really have to put our, ourselves in the shoes of the consumer and speak to what their needs and their emotions and their sentiments are going to be around travel. Uh, Alex, if I may, um, the, the all-inclusives as well, um, I mean, the, again, an advantage in this whole process is the containment. Um, it's, there's a downside for that, obviously, but uh, the advantage has been the containment and they're able to manage health safety much more effectively in that regard. Now, the challenge is that we know that the traveler likes to get out and about and experience, and that's that's been a trend for a number of years, and uh, and we've worked hard to build new experiences and so on. So how do we how do we capture that? It gets back to training, so that the training and the protocols, I think Diana mentioned it earlier, the whole continuum of the traveler's experience from getting into ground transportation at arrival at the airport to uh, to going to the accommodation to uh, going out and about and exploring, uh, you know, attractions, excursions, and all of that. Every aspect of that has to be on board in terms of the training and readiness. That's what we've got to make as commitments as destinations to uh, to to recover this and make sure that that the recovery is is as spread as it can be with, uh, while still protecting the uh, health sa health safety of residents and, and, and employees and, and 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 the operations. Another big question a lot of people in the industry have is about aviation. Um, and about how to socially distance on planes. Um, that we had a question about that uh, from the audience. Mariel, can you talk a little bit more about about how Delta is is enforcing that and and, and causing? Absolutely. Um, a couple of ways that Delta is implementing social distancing measures. Number one, we're capping all flights between 50 and 60 percent, uh, and we're also blocking all middle seats for all of our flights that we're serving right now. So those are two powerful ways. And, and in terms of capping the seats, so if you have 100 seats in an aircraft, 60 of them are only the seats that are available for customers to sit in. And we're blocking middle seats specifically for social distancing measures. Now, that's specifically on board our planes. But as I mentioned throughout the entire journey, at the jet bridge, at the gate, at the check-in counter, there will be decals on the floor to indicate where it's safe to stand and where they're six feet apart from the person in front of them or behind them. And similarly in the TSA and the security checkpoint as well. Uh, now we have another question. I'll, I'm gonna start with you, Ronella. The question is, do you think customers will still have a great desire to enjoy, uh, to enjoy destination tours and attractions? Uh, what changes or expectations do you think customers will have on deciding on whether to experience a particular tour or attraction? Yes, absolutely. I think um, what we see from uh, surveys and research conducted is that uh, there is a, a pent up demand to travel again. So that excitement of travel uh, traveling is still there. And um, as indicated in the case of Aruba, uh, we not only have, we not only make sure that we, we have the protocols for the airport for um, the accommodations, but also for instance, for activity providers, tours, taxis, car rentals. So all those, um, who together form the, are an integral part of the customer journey. And with those protocols in place, so as long as you have these accounted for, then um, there should be no reason to be concerned um, that we will be able to provide that service and that experience. And um, I have no doubt that the customer will, would want to also enjoy these things of Aruba as a destination, or for that matter, other destinations in the Caribbean, of course. Awesome. 
Another question we have uh, from Stephen Keats is about the projects that are in development. Uh, Frank, let me ask you, I mean, what are you seeing with, const with hotel construction? Have, have projects restarted? Um, how is that pipeline being affected right now? Well, as of the end of February, we had in the region about 30,000 rooms uh, in some phase of development. About half of them were, uh, were under construction. So we anticipate that most of those under construction will complete construction and a number of those will open, uh, how many remains to be seen. Uh, but um, we, we, we do anticipate that those were in the planning stage, if, we, if we're looking at history, that uh, about 75% of them, normally about 40% of them don't, don't come to fruition anyway if they're in some stage of planning, but we anticipate over 75% will not come to, uh, to fruition uh, at this point in the economy. So, um, and, and about 40 plus percent of those that are in uh, development in some stage are out of the DR followed by the Jamaica. So uh, those, that's, there's a predominance of, of, of impact in those areas. Another question uh, about destinations. What kind of testing are we seeing? Uh, Renella, can you talk a little bit about what the experience might be for, for visitors coming to Aruba? Yeah, I think what Mariela mentioned is, is critical because uh, um, one has to think about the customer journey pre-arrival as well. So um, I think Delta covered part of, a part of that. However, as a destination, yes, the, 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 the safety nets in terms of uh, um, ensuring the customer that the, the journey will be safe, but also um, ensuring our own community that we are managing things properly will, be, uh, will start at the pre-entry requirements or with that. With that, in the case of Aruba, through that process, um, we, will, um, we will include um, a self-health, for instance, declaration. We will also include an app with all of the information one can download, uh, but also critical changes to our immigration form, which is mandatory, and it will be mandatory to complete it uh, within X hours prior to arrival online. So that is a critical change. Once they arrive on island, there will be a 100% temperature check, a 100% symptoms check, and at the airport, we will have PCR rapid tests available in case needed, and that is only in case a medical practitioner sees the need to be able to uh, conduct a test at the airport. Again, that's part of an example of, of how we utilize the test as part of the customer journey. And of course, aside from that, there will be a dedicated or dedicated stations with, with testing uh, exclusively for visitors. So that is how we account for it um, at this moment. We had another question about uh, sort of bubbles of different islands or different countries that have low cases. Is that something that you've considered, Ronello, even within the Dutch Caribbean at all? or? Yes, it is something that has been part of the dialogue with, uh, in this case, with uh, uh, our neighboring islands, uh, Curacao and Bonaire. And um, it is something that is in the pipeline. Uh, nothing definite as yet, but uh, we hope to, as a matter of fact, be able to announce a reopening date tomorrow. Um, so we're finalizing that part of the process. Uh, we're looking at uh, reopening in a month or so, um, to be honest. And that might be preceded by a, a, a bubble in combination with Curacao and Bonaire. But this is not confirmed as yet. It is something that is part of the dialogue. Right. Uh, Diana, let me ask you, uh, pretty early on in the, in the crisis, uh, Marriott CEO was very adamant, we will travel again. I think a lot of people really appreciated that message. Um, what kind of gives you the most optimism, what you're seeing about, about how we're going to get out of this? I think that what we're seeing, obviously, in China, we're seeing some of the, the resorts get returning to some relatively good occupancy numbers, what we're seeing in the U.S. as well. So the fact that we're seeing customers eager to get to so many of the beaches, again, and particularly when I think of the Caribbean and when I think about we will travel again to some of these destinations, I think that seeing that eagerness for people to travel again. The feedback from our Marriott Bonvoy customers has been amazing just from their um, engagement and their excitement. Obviously, we've extended benefits through 2022, so they will keep their same status into 2021. So having that 140 million plus members around the world ready to travel and maintaining their status also helps. But I think it's really seeing what our hotels are experiencing already in China and some parts of the Middle East and in the U.S. to be close to closer to home. 
So thank you. Well, um, I want to thank all of you for, for, for being here today. Uh, I think we've really given everyone a really good idea of, of the great efforts that we're all taking in the travel industry uh, to adapt to this very new, strange reality. Um, it's, it's a time of great change, but I think, as, as we've all seen, that it's a time of optimism. And I think now uh, we're going to see the travel industry start to rebound, um, and it's going to be an exciting. It might be a little messy, but uh, it's all, it's gonna, it's all going to work out. Um, so I want to thank Ronella Chinashu Gross from Aruba Tourism Authority, Frank Camito from the CHTA, Diana Plazas from Marriott, Leah Chandler from Discover Puerto Rico, and Mariela Sanchez from Delta. I want to thank Discover Puerto Rico particularly for helping put, us th put this together. Um, and thank you all for coming in and giving us your time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you have any more questions, uh, please let us know in the box and we'll try and answer them as well. Um, so thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much. Thanks, you all.